look closely. What do we all have in common? No matter what corner of the world you live in, you need food, water, shelter, and money. Half of every transaction involves money in exchange for goods or services, stocks, a loaf of bread, illegal drugs. You gotta pay for it. We spend much of our lives chasing money to make a living and accomplish our dreams. But it's also an instrument of destruction, some might say evil, driving criminals to lie, steal, and even murder. The existing banking system extracts enormous value from society, and it is parasitic in nature. Money is a catalyst for the worst and the best of human endeavor. Before civilization, we created currency, fuel for wars, the path to power, champion and enemy of innovation. Money is so integral to our society and our global economy that its true nature remains a mystery to most. This is the story of money, perhaps the end of money as we know it. No matter how fat your bank account or how thin your wallet, to us it's all cold hard cash. There are some who want to kill it, get rid of it, burn your dollars, your euros, your yen, and transform every penny you have into ones and zeros. Digital currency, entrust it to the web and computers spread across the planet. Magic internet money. It's called cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. Invented in secret, it was a gift to the world. It's not just the currency, but it's actually programmable money. A potential curse on bankers. I and mean, there's nothing that the, the big banks or politicians can do to stop it breaking every government's grip on money supply. What the internet did for information, Bitcoin is doing for money. Could it be the new gold? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you have to really stretch your uh, imagination to infer what the intrinsic value of Bitcoin is. Regulators, the Federal Reserve, the banking system, at least understand this is a thing that they have to take seriously. This is going to change the economic culture. Bitcoin could be a microeconomic miracle worker, and it could be a macroeconomic wrecking ball. Is Bitcoin the currency of the future? A godsend for criminals? Or a recipe for financial disaster? If you trust your money just as it is, we have a little story to share. Once upon a time, there was a big party with everyone standing around the punch bowl, drunk. Politicians credited the strong economy to their wise decisions. Businesses jumped into new profitable markets, ignoring risk. In fact, the experts said there was no risk. Then, troubling market data from minor countries spooked the markets. Rumors spread. More bad news rattled housing prices at the heart of the financial world. A major bank went insolvent. Investors and businesses made a run on the other banks demanding their cash deposits. The largest financial institutions in the center of the modern world were frozen. Assets were seized. Banks foreclosed. A credit crunch threatened the entire world economy. And then, finally, the government stepped in. The largest bank bailout ever. Swift action by the head of state had saved the day. Remember that? No, you don't. It happened 2,000 years ago. Rome, 33 AD. Ground zero for the first recorded liquidity crisis and government bailout in history. The largest empire the world had ever seen was brought to its knees by a banking disaster. Emperor Tiberius used money from the national treasury to bail out the country's troubled banks and companies. History may not repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. Badly. People in power and their money have always been at the very center of it.
The story of money is as old as civilization itself. When we lived in small tribes, keeping track of debt was easy. You owed somebody a load of firewood. A neighbor owed you a piece of meat. Credits and debits were kept in your head, a mental ledger. Currency is a language that allows us to express transactional value between people. It's a technology that's older than uh, the wheel. It's as old as fire. When humans wanted to trade outside their tribe or village, they needed something everyone could agree had value, something scalable. Enter commodity monies. There were many kinds, but each had to embody the same five characteristics. A commodity money is relatively scarce, easily recognizable, can be cut into smaller pieces. You can substitute one piece for another of equal value, and you can carry it around without too much trouble. In ancient Rome, it was salt. The Aztecs used cacao beans. It was whale teeth on Fiji, yak dung in Tibet, shells in Africa and China. Grains, metal, ivory, rare stones, leather, fish. If it had the five characteristics of commodity money, someone probably used it as currency. And then you ask, what value do these currencies have? If you go into a primary school, you'll see children exchanging rubber bands and Tamagotchi and Pokemon cards and baseball cards and sweets and candy and any other form of currency. People invent currency when they have no other currency. And now they're going to invent digital currencies. But commodities that aren't durable are a lousy store of value. A bad cacao crop or a huge new salt discovery can throw your currency and economy into turmoil. A more stable system was needed. About 2,500 years ago, the first metal coins were minted in China and in what is now Turkey. These coins shared the same five characteristics with commodity money, but were also very durable. In some cases, coins are the only thing left of entire civilizations. Money does not originate with governments. Money arises naturally as markets uh, begin to develop and as people with the division of labor realize that if I have eggs and you have a cow, we may need some medium of exchange in order for you to buy my eggs or for me to buy your cow. Coins were an objective and universal unit of account and they allowed people to buy and sell goods over vast regions. The market economy was born coins worked, but only if people trusted that the king or emperor who issued them wasn't cheating on the metal content. Using coins also meant that an authority now controlled the supply of your currency. Money and political power were inextricably linked, centralized. Minting coins in a steady and predictable manner allowed economic growth and stability. The Wushu coin in China retained its value for 500 years. In Constantinople, the Solidus lasted for 700 years. But in those times, the coins didn't have the, the milled, or this sort of milled edge. They were flat. And uh, what used to happen was, as coins were passing from people to people, people would cut little bits off. And in fact, some of the taxation that the kings would do would actually be take one-eighth of the coin off. Taxes built castles and financed military campaigns, expensive hobbies. Soon, royal mints were substituting cheaper metals for silver and gold. This is called debasement, and Europe's kings made a habit of it. The currency of France was debased every 20 months for 200 years. If no one can trust the gold or silver content of your coins, how can you trade with other countries? International merchants found a solution. They recognize that one person's debt has value. It can be traded or transferred. When those IOUs came from reputable sources, they could be used as a form of money, paper money. This money was not based on hard commodities or metal, but instead on someone's promise to pay. Merchant families like the Medici in 15th century Florence acted as clearinghouses for these IOUs. It worked like this. 
an English trader ordered a shipment of Italian cloth from the Medici for 100 gold coins. His promise to pay the Medici was put on paper. Meanwhile, the Medici owed 100 gold coins to another trading partner for delivery of wine from France. The parties didn't go to the expense of transporting and exchanging gold coins. Instead, the paper was transferred. Everyone agreed that the paper had value, 100 gold coins, but only because everyone trusted the Medici as solvent middlemen. They had created a paper money machine. Within a few generations, they rose from low crime to high finance. Their great wealth helped fuel the Italian Renaissance and elevated the family to levels of enormous political power, the power to marry into royal families and get elected as popes. The ties binding money to power, politics and influence now ran through church and state. Merchants had proven that creating paper currency could be wildly profitable. Goldsmiths wanted in on the action. Imagine it like this, if the goldsmith had seen over a period of time that some of the coins he was storing for people were gathering dust, the people who owned them don't need them right now. So what if I go and lend them out into the community and I charge them interest on this loan? So he starts out lending some of these gold coins and then later, he realizes, actually, people don't even want the gold coins. They just want the piece of paper that says the, the, the gold coins are in the bank and with the goldsmith. So I can now make a loan with these pieces of paper. And whatever I write on a piece of paper, as long as people trust me, they'll trust the paper. And effectively, the, the goldsmiths and the early day bankers, they had literally acquired the power to print money. More and more, private paper money from merchants and banks circulated and began to rival the crown's coins. The power inherent in controlling and issuing money began slipping away from the rulers. They couldn't tax or debase this new kind of money, but they had bigger ambitions than ever with trading posts, colonies, and empires that now stretched across the globe. For centuries, European countries would take turns building massive fleets and waging war on each other to rule the world. Government wanted to take the people's money in order to finance its wars. That's essentially the history of money. Money and warfare go together. War is expensive. One year's income taxes simply aren't enough. Kings and queens had to borrow money against future taxes. They needed a groundbreaking financial innovation, government bonds. The loans came from rich merchant families and goldsmiths, who by now had become powerful financiers and bankers. Sovereign debt and deficit spending had been born. In 1694, the Bank of England was established to fund a war against France. England's central bank was privately owned and granted the monopoly to issue banknotes, paper that could be redeemed for an equal amount of gold from the government coffers. The central bank soon also managed the entire debt of the crown. Money has been a tool of sovereignty for centuries. Being able to issue currency uh, gave you the power, but it also gave the value to that monetary supply by backing it with a force of state, with essentially the debt of state. When the U.S. won independence from Britain, the first article of the new constitution gave Congress the exclusive right to coin money. This currency's value was tied to gold in government vaults. From 1781 until the Panic of 1907, the financial system of the U.S. was an economic petri dish. Brief central banks, state banks, private banks, private currency, government currency, depressions, strong growth, recessions, regular boom and bust cycles. The long term, as far as capital is concerned, people want predictability. People want stability. From the back of that, they can plan. Now, it's very hard to plan in the long term with such a level of volatility. In 1913, bankers and politicians decided that it was in the country's best interest, and theirs, to have a permanent central bank. 
they created the Federal Reserve. Among its jobs, expand or contract the supply of a single national currency, the Federal Reserve Note. The dollar was tied to gold, and strategic control of it would avoid booms that lead to busts. At least that was the plan. Then came 1929. The Great Depression would have a profound effect on monetary policy worldwide. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis. Broad executive power. Soon the Fed had printed nearly all the money it legally could to pump life back into the economy. It needed gold to fire up the mint. So in 1933, President Roosevelt issued a controversial executive order, forcing all U.S. citizens to sell their gold to the Federal Reserve at a fixed price, or go to prison. The Fed offered far more cash to foreign governments for their gold. Many jumped at the offer. Gold flowed in, and dollars spread across the globe. World War II devastated nearly every major economy, except the United States. The military and industrial juggernaut emerged as the global financial superpower. The dollar had become the world's most stable and trusted currency. Other countries pegged their currency to the dollar, which could still be redeemed for gold. In fact, the US owned more than half of the world's gold reserves. In the next few decades, more dollars flowed to foreign countries. Governments began debasing their coins with cheaper metals and printing more of their own currency than they had in gold. The bond between precious metals and paper currency was cracking. This is a 1966 50 cent piece. It was the last coin uh, in regular circulation in Australia to contain silver, and it contains 80% silver. So in 1966, this was 50 cents. Nowadays, it's eight dollars, roughly, in silver alone. By 1966, foreign nations had had enough of the US collecting gold and printing cash. And they had more value in dollars than the US had bullion in its vaults. They demanded gold in return for their paper dollars. Arguments about the value of the dollar versus their currency ensued. In 1971, President Nixon settled the matter. He severed United States currency from the gold standard. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. Never again could anyone legally demand U.S. government gold in exchange for paper dollars. For better or worse, the dollar was now backed solely by the full faith and credit of the United States government. The wealthiest nation the world had ever known would bet its future on a single word, trust. People have this mythology of money that is based on very little fact. Uh, and one of the nice things about Bitcoin is that it forces people to start to ask questions about the fundamentals of money. Bitcoin is an attempt uh, to adopt the advanced computerized system that we have, the internet, to resurrecting what money used to be all about. I think our dollar policies, our monetary policies, our fiscal policies have absolutely created a, a, a nation of debtors. Not just personal debt, not just corporate debt, but government debt. I mean, you have to look at those all together as one big thing. What is the wealth of the nation? Well, the wealth of the nation is a gigantic hole of money that we owe to the rest of the world that is never going to be paid back. Today, the United States pays more than $400 billion in interest to its creditors every year. When a government spends more money than it collects in taxes, it simply borrows more, or it creates more. At one time, every piece of paper money was backed by gold. Remember, 
For every $20 bill, there was $20 worth of gold in a government vault. Not anymore. Today, governments create currency by first creating bonds or treasury bills. These bonds are sold in the market, generating funds for the government that issued them. Large banks buy U.S. bonds to flip them, selling them to the Federal Reserve at a profit. This is the magic money machine. You see, the Fed is America's central bank, but it doesn't have any money. No cash on its balance sheets. When a bank buys a bond and takes it to the Federal Reserve, the Fed simply says, thank you, Mr. Banker. Here's the principal and some profit. New money isn't exchanged. It simply appears on the bank's accounts. Magic. For 100 years and counting, the precise mechanisms of these bond purchases have remained a secret. Here's where it gets really interesting. The Federal Reserve is not a government agency. It's a private entity, and its shareholders are banks which earn a dividend. As much as $80 billion per year total are paid out to some of the very same banks that sell the government debt to the Fed. Which banks? Don't even bother asking. That's also a secret. In other words, the magic money machine answers to no one. The Fed also sets the bar for how much interest you pay for a car, home, or business loan. The Federal Reserve has been given the impossible task of trying to run the credit and monetary system as though we are the Soviet Union. Um, it's the central planner for the, for the key aspect of capitalism, which is how money and credit is allocated. The Federal Reserve, on balance, uh, does not help the economy. On balance, it hurts the economy. And it's bound to make mistakes, even with the best of intentions. The Fed is also supposed to boost employment with low interest rates, encouraging people and businesses to buy more goods and services. Governments getting involved in money is a good thing, and it's also a bad thing. It's a good thing because money is the arteries of the economy, the blood supply of the economy. Markets are subject to bouts of euphoria and despair. And it makes sense for governments to back currency and manipulate it. Moving the money supply up and down is the most powerful way to sedate that boom and bust cycle. Manipulating the supply of money has short-term and long-term consequences. Central banks aim to create new money carefully, strategically, and very, very slowly. Releasing more money into the economy causes prices to rise, ideally by 2% every year. That's supposed to foster economic growth. But 2% inflation means the buying power of one cash dollar in your pocket today will be 98 cents next year, and less nearly every year to come. Since 1913, when the Federal Reserve took over the United States dollar, we've seen that the United States dollar has decreased in value 98%. Inflation is a far higher tax, because on your income, you pay it just once. If inflation is 2%, you're paying a 2% tax on your net worth every single year, your net worth held in currency. So, what does that mean? If you earned a dollar in 1913, you could buy 16 loaves of bread. Today, a dollar barely buys you one. That's not a quaint notion of how cheap things used to be. It's proof that the value of your cash is slowly withering away. That one dollar invested at 2% in 1913 would now be worth $7.24 more than 600% return versus a near total loss. The US dollar has gone from being worth $1 to now being worth about four cents. Uh, so that's, you know, 96% of its original value. And it's a direct result of government control. Governments don't create money from thin air all alone. 
You play a key role in the magic money machine. It's not really the central banks that are the problem. I mean, they're part of the problem, but the real problem is that we've given the power to create money to the same banks that caused the financial crisis. We put our paychecks and savings into a bank account and draw from it as we need it. The banks are custodians of our money, right? Wrong. It is now the property of the bank on their balance sheets. They can do just about anything they want with it. For example, create new money. Here's how. Your bank account shows $100, but the bank only holds three and loans 97 to Bob to buy something. In the bank's computers, you still have $100 in your account, but Bob now has $97 of new virtual money in his account. Just digits on a computer screen. There's no cash. No gold or anything else backing up the new numbers in Bob's account. Just his promise to pay it back. This is new money created as debt. When those $97 are spent, say in a shop, the shop owner deposits into another bank and it is lent out again and again and again. And each of these people have numbers in their accounts showing that they own this money. So your original $100 has multiplied. Now there are over $3,300 in the system. This process of loaning out far more money than a bank actually has as cash on hand is called fractional reserve banking. In the UK, 97% of the money that exists is just numbers in the computer system, and those numbers are created by the banks. Banks earn untold billions in interest every year by creating and lending virtual money. What's more, banks don't even need your deposit to create new money. If they consider someone credit worthy for a loan, they can put new magic money into his or her account and start charging interest. So reporters talk about Bitcoin as though it's, a, as though it's the first digital currency. But actually, we use digital currency every time you make a, a transaction through internet banking or through your, your bank card. It, actually, it's not even just digital currency. It's digital currency that is created by the banks, essentially, out of nothing. In other words, all new money is debt. This is the part of money creation that isn't taught in economics class. Money in paychecks, bank accounts, 401ks, that loan to Bob, credit card debt, your home loan, all began life as virtual money created by the banks. The entire system is based on trust. Trust in the bank's solvency. Trust in the debtor's ability to repay their debt. If all bank customers demanded just 3% of their deposits right now in cash, this run on the banks would reveal the truth. Almost none of that paper currency you think is in your bank account exists. It never did. Remember the drunken party? Our financial crisis had everything to do with virtual dollars. Too many people with very little income borrowed a lot of money they could never repay. But the banks didn't care. They didn't have to. They quickly made and sold shaky loans to someone else for a profit. And I got them all approved. Hey! Apply now. Selling bad loans was a good business until the whole thing blew up in a global financial crisis. The magic money machine destroyed 30 million real jobs. The United States alone lost $16 trillion in household wealth and the banks foreclosed on more than one million homes. Selling subprime loans and betting they will fail may not be sacred, but it is lucrative. As much as one quarter of our best and brightest are being lured by the siren call of the money machine. 
Instead of science, engineering, or medicine, they chose a career playing with, betting with, other people's money. To get rich quick, very rich. And sometimes, they take shortcuts. Getting by on a nickel and a dime. My ancestors in Greece talked about the corrupting influence of power, and nothing has changed in these 3,000 years. When you give control over massive amounts of money to a few individuals, they will take advantage of that control. Banks today are factoring in fines and money laundering and all the rules that they break into their cost of doing business. JP Morgan is today coming out and saying that Bitcoin is uh, not a legitimate way of doing business. Banks today are tied into a system that is completely rigged to basically harvest money from the entire global economy and pump it into the hands of very few. Don't get consumed by The existing banking system is cozy, it's captured the regulators, it extracts enormous value from society without delivering anything in return, and it is parasitic in nature. The banks play a very pivotal role in an economy. You look at any successful economy, it has successful banks. There's a very close correlation with banking profits and the economy as a whole. In medieval Europe, a banker who couldn't repay depositors was hanged. Today, that same banker would get bailed out paid bonuses, and enjoy some tax benefits, too. To date, no senior U.S. banking executive has been charged for selling the bad loans that fueled the Great Recession.